Bilden går slut i fär. We're not going to drive 55, we're going to drive 155. In the 1970s, there was this mentality of government oppression and different ways that people might rebel against that. And so Brock Yates thought that the perfect automotive manifestation of that would be a there are no rules street race across the country. The adrenaline's pumping. 35 hours and 53 minutes. Many a team never spoke to each other again after the event because it was so grueling. It was about putting great drivers in great cars on real roads and seeing what was possible. This event goes on without most innocent law-abiding civilians ever finding out about it. Everyday people, they'd have this adventure for their entire lives. They'd come home from this and they were heroes. So you release this legend into the context of cinema. Let's get that first car up here. We're gonna get this thing underway. This is one of the biggest films of 1981. Bert was the hot ticket at that particular time. The funny part was many of the people in the movie didn't know there was a real thing. They thought this was a script. When you look at the reasons we become car guys, I'm not sure there's one that's responsible for the continuation of the love of cars more than the opening scene of Cannonball Run. It was, for many individuals, the first time they got to see a Countach, or the first time they got to hear a Countach. No one at that time thought the way that Lamborghini did. The Countach was unapologetic. Is the Lamborghini Countach for everyone? No, I think uh, it's uh, a special car for special people. Having a car that was 180 miles per hour, 190 miles per hour, was completely insane. This was an emotional, a cultural impact that will never be forgotten. We have become the nation on wheels with more motorized mobility than ever dreamed of. The day you go for your license is the biggest thing that's happened since you were born. The great love affair does not always seem to make good sense. But then, good sense has never had anything to do with love. In the early 1970s, Americans at large were facing a lot more external forces than they were really used to. We were looking at terrible inflation, interest rates were very high, unemployment was rampant. It was just a really bleak time. You tell that god governor he's gonna police this god gasoline situation. I will not take the blame for this. Anger and bewilderment are growing as more and more Americans cope with gasoline lines and empty pumps. For millions of Americans, this may be the worst weekend they've ever faced for finding gasoline to give them the automobile freedom they take as their due. Say it all out of gas! Feedback from the war, feedback from fuel crisis ideas. How long were you online yesterday? Not very long, about an hour and a half. That's not very long. Today it's over two and a half hours. The idea that cars were not allowed to have emissions and they were constraining performance and the muscle car era was certainly coming to a bit of an end. North America's most important consumer product is the automobile. It has been the main target of consumer concern. Laws were cracking down on the cars that you loved and the manufacturers that you loved to support and it just felt like as a car guy you were being attacked from all angles. Yes, the car would be housebroken and the deviates who dug them as devices of pleasure cleansed from the highways and returned to society as constructive citizens. We had speed kills, you know, 55 mile an hour speed limit, all these restrictions. All of a sudden, you know, the Nixon administration came down to 55 to save fuel. And look, we got more fuel floating around than we've ever had. We're bathing in fuel, it's all political. And I think that's what Brock's statement was. For some reason or another, I don't know what happened to me, some brain went into neutral or something, and I decided one day that we ought to have a no-holds-barred race from New York to Los Angeles. And there was a great cross-country driver by the name of Cannibal Baker, and he had done a bunch of record runs in the 1920s and 30s, and uh, so I, I named the event after him. 
You get an old issue of National Geographic. It had car ads in there. They used to hire a guy named Cannonball Baker. Right. And he would drive it cross country trying to promote the performance of the car and in the 20s or teens, that was a hell of an accomplishment. Cannonball Baker set more than 140 point-to-point -point records in his life, and he did them in all sorts of things, in cars and motorcycles, racing trains, doing hill climbs, and of course he was doing it at a time where there was no developed roadway, there was no infrastructure. He would break down, he would be lost for days, all the things that you would imagine would go with that type of adventure, but it was him. I could envision this guy riding coast to coast, and challenging himself to conquer the feat of doing something that was legendary. Hi, I'm Brock Yates. As an automotive writer, I'm constantly... Brock Yates was a very bright, commanding kind of person. He was one of the most creative minds I think yeah. I ever knew. He could put in writing what a lot of people thought, but a lot of people couldn't say. He was very broad-gauged informed about politics and history and cars and racing. Early on, they called him the assassin because he just said what he thought, and he didn't care about paying a price. I suppose half the fun of the Cannonball Baker was anticipating the indignant hen clucking that would arise in its wake. Let Nader and his ilk maunder inside their airbags. I wouldn't say he was intentionally charming. <laughs> he was just charming. I mean, in those days, he was considered a bad boy. He wrote for virtually everybody. He did Time Magazine, he did American Heritage, he had a column for the Washington Post, he did Sports Illustrated. He liked the challenge of doing different things. He did the first air Daytona 500. Right, let's go to Brock Yates. Absolute pandemonium down here. Brock Yates was a phenomenal writer. He was an accomplished driver. He loved to drive because it was life his way, and that was very important to him. He was associated and knew everybody that was in the automotive scene, and it made him kind of the perfect linchpin for a movement like Cannonball. He had all the connections, he had access to the cars, and he had the ideas and the gumption to go out and actually exploit them. You gotta remember, and, um... In the early 70s, everybody went nuts. The government was getting involved in, in automobiles. Ralph Nader was at full cry. This man is not in politics. Yet today, he's one of the most influential men in the United States. Ralph Nader, Brock knew very well, and they hated, <laughs> they hated each other, each espousing a totally different philosophy about cars and speed and fuel. The automobile touched all Americans. and. Now, this was, to me, the, the perfect interface between a major a, a public issue, having pollution, safety, uh, economic significance, uh, and the day-to-day -day life of, of millions of people. Nader was a fierce, fierce competitor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. He's an excellent student of what it takes to gain notoriety or attention for the things that he thinks are important. Not too many people take on GM and win. It's in his headlong pursuit of the car industry that Nader has made many of his enemies. Brock was on a different track. Speed doesn't kill, Brock would say. People do. Bad drivers. Superlative handling, braking, steering, lighting, etc. coupled with driver competence is the true key to sanity on the highways. He wrote a wonderful piece in 1971 explaining to the public and his critics why this event was important and it had nothing to do with let's get out and drive fast and break all the laws. That's the way it's going to be, car freaks. In the first demonstration that some people are aware enough to handle their own destinies behind the wheel of an automobile. Of course the whole thing is going to raise hell and the day might come when guys are busting across the nation in some sort of nutball protest that people who know how to keep cars under control are not going to collapse in the face of government bureaucracy. The other guys in the automotive press can sit around and recommend letter writing to your congressman, but I've had it. In the spring of 71, no one showed up. Brock said, you know, the hell with it, I'm just going to do it. His son, Brock Jr., was 15, and the editor, Steve Smith, was there, and he said, get in the car, and off they went to do the cannonball all alone. We took a Dodge van and uh, modified it a little bit. What they call it, moon trash, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Oh, we just went across the country. We got lost and had some horrible uh, slowdowns and 
ran out of gas. Nobody had really documented the experience of driving nonstop from New York to LA for time. And it was never going to be a wildly impressive time. It took us 41 hours. <laughs> There was a sense of humor to it, a sense of the absurd to it. We're gonna do it because we can. You know, it's rebellion against this 55 mile an hour speed limit. I wanna show that we can do something like this and we can have fun on the American roads and be safe. They just went out to see truly like how exhausting, how grueling was it going to be? And that gave way to some invitations. Readers wrote back, well, I can do it faster than that. So he said, well, let's meet in New York and try it. He threw down the gauntlet again in November of 71. It was called the Cannonball Baker See the Shining Sea Memorial Trophy Dash. Well, that was too much for anybody to say, so it just became the Cannonball. It was kind of the perfect namesake for uh, no excuses, no holds barred drive from here to anywhere. The only rule is you have to be driving the same car the entire time. It doesn't matter what route you take. It doesn't matter what type of car you drive. It's just who's going to get from Manhattan to California in the shortest amount of time. Why would you do it like that? Why not? <laughs> good answer, because it's there. It's there. When you think about the idea of, well, we need to organize a bunch of cars in Manhattan, that's pretty inconvenient, but fortunately, through Car and Driver, Brock Yates had access to the Red Ball parking garage, so that was the logical starting point. It's on East 31st Street. When they were looking for an endpoint in Los Angeles, there was the Portofino Inn, which was run by Mary Davis, who was kind of a fan of racing, and she would host parties there and things like that. And so it was just kind of the right coastal ending point with a good parking lot and some cool signs. You'd think that amongst a world of car enthusiasts, if you proposed a race like this, you would get hundreds and hundreds of entries. But in fact, the first one was a dozen cars or so. I ended up with a Ferrari Daytona with Dan Gurney, my old teammate. Not all that much preparation with respect to the way you would normally prepare a car for Cannonball, but they set a time of 35 hours and 54 minutes, which was, of course, the new record. Now that Ralph Nader, who proudly proclaims that he seldom drives himself, has become the principal spokesman for America's drivers, we, as a group of people who like automobiles, are being pushed to a point where we are beyond the law. It was illegal on the face of it to break the speed limit. I think car guys hate all speed limits. That's right. <laughs> That's a good point. Speed limits are at best hypocritical, at worst specious, so they must be accepted as a fact of life, but hardly as canon law. After all, if the cops don't observe them, and they don't, believe me, then why should we? Despite the economic squeeze on the European show circuit, this year's display at Geneva had its fair share of new and noteworthy cars. The Italian makes were most impressive. In 1971, you have the Geneva Auto Show. The Lamborghini Countach was unveiled. It shocked the world. Before it had been released to the public, you had Bob Wallace and you had one of the other engineers that was going to see the car in Breton for the first time. Apparently the lights were off in the room and security was letting them in to come see the car. And when someone turned on the lights, the security guard said Countach, which essentially meant boy. The Countach is radical. You look at it and you go, my God, this is a spaceship. It's a different approach. Looking back, the beauty of Lamborghini was, you know, Ferrari as a manufacturer that was building cars for a purpose. It was building production cars to fund racing. And the same with Porsche. Lamborghini was completely opposite. Lamborghini was not a brand that has its history in racing. And that's been a criticism at times, but that's not always what road cars are about. Great race cars make terrible road cars. And usually great road cars make terrible race cars. People don't build race cars to look awesome. And that's what this was. When Ferruccio came up with this concept of having something different, this was all about the high life. And back in the day, there weren't many exotic vehicles, if you think about it, there were only a few. Ferruccio Lamborghini was a entrepreneur and industrialist in Italy. He had a tractor company, amongst many other companies. He had an air conditioning company as well and other things. He at the time actually had a 250 GT Ferrari and he was basically complaining about the clutch and complaining about other issues with the car. The story goes that he'd went to go complain to Enzo Ferrari and say, hey, maybe we should change this or do this. And Ferrari told him to basically get out of his office. He said, you know, you stick to building tractors and, you know, I'll stick to building cars. And I think Ferruccio was, you know, the type of character that wasn't gonna take no and decided that he was gonna go build a better car. 
first prototype was built in 1963. And then imagine by 1964, 1965, they had a production car, which is the 350 GT. The 350 GT was essentially Frucho's answer to the 250 GT and the other GT cars produced by Ferrari. V12 front engine. And if you look at a 350 GT, the details are outstanding. I mean, the fit and finish and, and the gauges and all these different things. To this day, people walk in our showroom and if we have a GT, they go right to the car. The beauty of what Frucho did was he went to the best of the best. I mean, if you go down the list of the engineers that have worked in Lamborghini during those early days, you have Bizzarini, Delara, you have Stanzani, you know, on and on and on. And he allowed great teams to do incredible work. There was no, we shouldn't do that, or no, it was really, you know, forward thinking. You look at that evolution, so you have the 350 GT as the first production car, and then within, let's call it a year or two, you have the launch of the Mura. There was nothing like it as a production car, a transverse mid-engine that was beautiful. Ferruccio Lamborghini really set a bold statement as a boutique supercar manufacturer, and at that time, the concept had not been described yet, would those two cars as his first production cars. In many ways, a Lamborghini is a caricature of a normal car. Yes, it has an engine, but it's got 12 cylinders. It's naturally aspirated. Yes, it has a transmission, but it's a gated manual gearbox that gives you an unmistakable and totally distinct driving characteristic. Yes, people spent time trying to make it visually appealing, but instead of just doing it to be good enough, they took it to the moon and back to make sure that anybody who ever saw it would never forget. These cars are a labor of love to the brand and to the engineers and the designers that are behind them. Remember, this was all handmade in Bologna. They were in a production facility of craftsmen from the engine bits to machining parts. Nothing left that facility. You saw artisans that were pounding the aluminum panels. The detail that goes into putting the cars together and building that engine, it was incredible. How do you follow an act like the Mura? Just probably the most beautiful car ever produced. When a car like a Lamborghini Countach was built, you're not necessarily looking to say, hey, how do we make this most comfortable and how many golf clubs can we put in it? When you build a car like that, the first priority is always the experience. And not just the experience of the driver, but anyone who comes into contact with the car. You're talking about something that stirs the emotions and excites the senses in ways that most things never could. The Countach was developed over many years. Bertone Design, that was the design house that was responsible for the Countach body but Marcello Gandini is the person who designed it. La Countach invece era il desiderio di distaccarsi ovviamente da questo passato. Se vogliamo in questo si avvicina un po' all'opera d'arte, cioè che non è obbligata a piacere. Bob Wallace was the original test driver, really developed the Countach. You can see him driving this original LP500, which was the prototype car. That was eventually developed into the first LP400, the Periscopio. The original LP400s were referred to as Periscopio cars, and the reason why is that there was this indent in the roof, and the rear view mirror came up the top, and you could see it through the indent. Just taking a step back at the vehicle and looking at how dramatic it was, what other vehicle can you and I think about in the 70s that had that type of design? Nothing. The concept of Lamborghini making a bold statement to Enzo Ferrari and how the company was started almost like an FU to you know society. It's like, I can do this and I will. And I think that DNA has stuck with Lamborghini from the Countach. This design is the classic wedge. It's 50 years old this year. All of these decades later, you can still park that car in any lot and it still looks futuristic. No matter how old it gets, it just seems to be timeless to where it never seems like an older design. The ingenuity underneath is really what's out of this world for that time its chassis, the design of all these tubular components that create almost like a birdcage. I think you could probably hang a chassis at a modern museum and people would say, wow, that's incredible. The Countach, when it came out in the 70s, it set the bar and it's always been the one that people just said, this is the most amazing car anybody's ever made. Not just aesthetically was it wild with the doors that went up. I mean, you're talking about a V12 engine that at the time was producing almost 400 horsepower. Later variants, imagine carbureted almost 500 horsepower in a car that could almost break 200 miles per hour. The incredible feeling of stability and purpose 
and the sheer precision of a car that has no other reason for existence than to spear down the road as far and as fast as possible. That feeling is so strong in the Countach, it can take your breath away. After the first run in November of 1971, Rock Yates had the record. But when you set a record like that, obviously it's the mark to beat. And in 72, they had some bad weather, so nobody was able to beat it in the second real competitive running. I wrote a note to Brock Yates and said, if you ever run this again, invite me. Brock was very selective in who he would allow and, and how that was all going to be organized. Everybody was screened. You had to have somebody vouch for you. You had to have a certain insurance coverage. You had to have a skill set as a driver. If somebody was too gung-ho, they didn't qualify. We took no chance. We never scared or endangered anyone else. We wanted to be careful. We didn't want to embarrass Brock, right? Yeah. These are capable drivers in capable cars driving safely, and they were. And so is that going to carry the day? Is that going to compel policy? No. But it made it a little bit more redemptive. Now, does that little rationale give us license to run across the country at 150 miles per hour? Of course not. Driving is a social responsibility and has to be measured by prudence and good judgment. The Cannonball Baker will be one with steadiness and smoothness. In 75, Brock Yates said, we're going to do it again. I get a postcard that says, we're going to run Cannonball in four weeks. If you're interested, call us and we'll send you the information. So I did. Jack May went out in his white 246 Dino, a gorgeous Ferrari. We weren't so prepared. We didn't even have a fuzz buster, and we didn't have any driving lights until we got to New York. We did have a fuel cell. He had this white Dino, put a fuel cell in it. It's leaking fuel. And the photographer wanted a white car in the front. And I had the only other white car. I had a three-year-old Porsche 911. So they put my car in the front, you know. I finished 13th, but I got pole position on the roof. And it didn't fix the leak. We really leaked all the way to yeah. California. Really? Yeah, I didn't that. smoke. But. <laughs> you didn't smoke. <laughs> Every time you would see someone do it, you'd learn how they did it. And throughout all that, they're able to devise their own way to just up the ante a bit. And so every time you see better prepared cars, better lighting, better electronics, not only did they have CB radios, which were really, really useful because the truckers were also trying to outsmart the cops, but you also had rudimentary police scanners, and you'd also have some radar detectors, fuzz busters and things like that, that worked okay. You'd also have kill switches for your lights, maybe both sets of lights, and certainly different ways to disguise the car, different things to disguise the drivers. Guys are doing a lot of scams. Uh, Peter Brock, who designed the Cobras, he and three other guys ran in 1972 disguised as priests. The two troopers stood ready at the sides of the Mercedes rear doors with hands on guns tensed for the shootout. Easy does it, said I to myself as I slipped out of the driver's seat, exposed my clerical collar as prominently as I could without straining my Adam's apple. Excuse me, father, I, I didn't know. That's quite all right, I interrupted, adding that I could appreciate the dangers of being an officer of the law in today's violent times. This is a situation where you have a multivariable problem to solve, not only about how you're going to drive, when you're going to time your passage through all the major cities, the way that you're going to prepare yourself physiologically for obviously a race that's much longer than anything else that they would have endured, the navigational choices that you're going to make. We were sitting there with the road maps trying to figure well, it out. Yeah, yeah, we had a triple A road maps. <laughs> triple A trip we had <laughs> Mark, who the yellow mark? Yeah. You had to calculate weather. You had to calculate mileage fuel stops, food, bathroom stops. The winners will maintain a really rapid average speed, be fortunate enough to avoid trouble or breakdowns, lose minimum time in refueling and other stops, and pick a good route. We came down from the roof of the Red Ball garage. He said, where do you want to go? I said, now. He stamps a ticket, I pull out, and there's a red light. <laughs> you know, that's a great start. <laughs> we left about 10 o'clock at night. We started three hours after Brock Yates because he knew to get to California before the rush hour. He didn't bother to tell anybody else that, of course. You had to choose who drove when, what your skill sets were. It's about two o'clock in the morning and I'm whipped. So I pull up in a rest area, he says, time for you to take over, Tom. He gets in the car and we pull out. He's like, hmm, so what's wrong? <laughs> he says, never could drive at night. We were averaging close to 100. We're listening to the CB. Somebody says, there's a smoky out signpost, such and such. 
before we got to the next signpost, here comes a cop the other way. And Buzzbuster goes off, he turns his light on. We come up to the first exit, and the truckers had slowed down to keep us from getting off of it. They wanted to help the police and get get You, the, you they did. We made friends with them before we got to Well, them. we weren't as smart as you were. <laughs> No, we'd call the truckers and tell them we were coming and we were late for whatever it was we were doing. And they wanted someone going faster than them. So if we said we're a mile behind you, you know, then they were expecting us. But if you came up and blew by without announcing your presence, boy, they got mad. I said, well, I guess this is it. So I just slowed down and pulled into the median. Had six cop cars that came up. And boy, they were excited. <laughs> Paid the fine. That got us back on the road. And that took about an hour. And my co-driver, Rick Klein, and I said, well, we're screwed. We weren't doing it for fun. We were doing it to beat the record. And that's why I knew what our average was. And from 96 or something, I said, well, heck, fire. We can still do it. Rick drove about an hour. I said, well, you got to speed it up. Let me drive again. It was fun at the start and fun at the finish. Uh, the, what, 2,500 miles in between? Wasn't a whole lot of fun. <laughs> We made best time on two lane roads. We could put it on 125, 130, there was anybody there. Go from one grain tower to the next. When we got to the edge of California, we knew we were getting close to the record. Got Portofino in, ran in, hit the time clock, and they did that stamp. I knew exactly what that stamp had to say. I looked at it, you could have heard me holler here from there. He did break the record, but only by a single minute, 35-53. One minute. One minute. When they realized it was a record, then everyone got excited about it except Brock. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was just mad because he beat him by a minute. Yeah. If he beat him by five, he probably wouldn't be as mad. <laughs> I knew I could do it. We had the machine, and we had the talent, and we had the luck. I wasn't as fast as Jack. I didn't do the right route as Jack. I'm making excuses for my time, which was 40 hours, I think, in 39 minutes. Cannonball's the kind of thing that anybody hears about it, and like, that sounds like a movie. Cannonball Run, the only movie to get over 200 tickets before it even opens. The movie was a product of his relationship with Hal Needham. Hal Needham, as Brock would say, he's the bravest man I've ever met. He would tackle anything. There was a movie about the spirit of St. Louis. That was his first gig. There's a wing walker. That's Hal. He had never done that before. That basically started his career as a stunt person in the movie industry. He worked with everybody, he did everything. He became a very good friend of Burt Reynolds. They shared a house together. Burt gave him his first opportunity to direct Smokey and the Band. We've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. I'm eastbound to watch your band run. <laughs> Hal made a fortune, made a fortune for Burt, made the movie famous. When they went to do the sequel, Brock did some rewriting on Smokey too. And that's how Brock got into the movie business. There was a lot of interest in a lot of different people that wanted to have the Cannonball movie. There were two movies that were based on Brock's idea of Cannonball. Anything goes in a squealing, smashing outlaw race across America. Cannonball. Fasten your seatbelts and get ready for fun. The Gumball Rally. The Gumball Rally came out before Cannonball, which made Brock very mad because they stole yeah. his idea. Brock didn't have the money to fight it. So the Cannonball, in terms of a movie project, just kind of dissipated and went away. Frankly, I have always felt a fictional version of the race has limited appeal. It seems to me the only unique quality about the Cannonball story is that it actually happened. Hal Needham liked the idea and thought it was a good venue for fun mm -hmm. stories. Needham said, I'm gonna do it, and I'm gonna do it my way, finally, Brock realized Needham was serious. Brock Yates and Hal Needham had been talking about different ideas for a screenplay, and they thought that they might live out some of those ideas in a final running in 1979. Hal informed me 
we're going to do it with an ambulance. Who's going to stop an ambulance, you know, with a patient inside? And then Hal said, you're going to be the patient. It's a piece of cake. You can lay down. <laughs> you know, you can sleep. They got Chrysler to donate a van, and it was often literally to the races. At the start of the Cannonball in Darien, Connecticut, this illegal underground nobody knows event. There were 2,000 screaming people there. It was bedlam, it was crazy. But in the meantime, Hal had gotten off the plane in Hartford, dragging this real doctor with him, who Hal had met in a bar on the Sunset Strip. He didn't have a clue what he was getting into, but he was gonna be our doctor and then everybody took off. I was driving and we were trying to figure out all the lights and sirens and stuff, and it, uh, the uh, New Jersey Highway Patrol nailed us. My wife Pamela was the patient. We had her in the back in a gurney. She had a, a, a water bottle that was draining down her arm. It was supposed to be some kind of an IV bottle. I'm scared to death because it's now it's reality. All we hear is, where the hell are you guys going? Hal says, Los Angeles. <laughs> and they're on the Bergen County exit of the <laughs> New Jersey Turnpike. I looked at Needham and then we knew, I mean, if we blew it at this point, we are going to jail. There's no doubt about it. I knew that those two geniuses, Alan Brock, were just dying. We had a forged tag. So if they had run the plates and everything, they would have known. The guy said, well, have you got a patient in there? And we said, yeah. And, uh, and they said, well, why can't you fly her? And I said, well, you better ask the doctor. And we slid that door open. My wife's laying there looking dead in this, in this, in this gurney. I mean, it was, it was edgy. What's wrong with the patient, and why can't you fly her? The doctor says, she has fibrocystic disease of the lungs, and the senator's wife cannot be flown. I'm kind of out under this mask, and I'm saying, boy, that was pretty good, you know, that's not bad. <laughs> so that backed the cops down right away, and it was so perfect. They turned to us and they said, well, you boys better take it easy, go slower and whatever, because you got the lights on and doing all that stuff. We kind of pulled away and continued to go. That year, a new record was set. David Hines and Dave Yarbrough in a Jaguar XJS in 32 hours and 51 minutes. And so that was the record that stood, in terms of Brock Yates' view of the history, forever, because that was the last real cannonball. It went from, you know, being, whoa, the cannonball, everybody's all excited, to Brock Yates saying no more. Because Brock got a call from a fellow that had run in the prior cannonball, Terry Bernius. We went over to Terry's house and he raises the garage door and looking us straight in the face was this black Lamborghini Countach. And he was so excited and who wouldn't be? It was so exotic and totally different than anything you'd see on the street. Then he said to Brock, and I bought this because it's gonna win me the next cannonball. We came back to our car and I said to Brock, okay, what's up? Pammy, he said, I can never run another cannonball. I was stunned. And I said, what are you talking about? What do you mean? And he said, that man is a very nice man and he's a decent driver, but he's not good enough to drive that car fast. Someone's gonna get really hurt. And he said, I won't be responsible for that. That car killed the cannonball. The light went off in Brock's head. He says, these cars are getting too fast for us. It's gotten out of hand. You know, you're, you're getting close to 200 miles an hour. It's a very simple reason how the cannonball came to an end. I think when Terry Bernius realized that there was not going to be another cannonball, he had to do something with the car. <laughs> By then, the movie had started to percolate. Hal Needham and Brock Yates began kind of writing it together. They would be locked into Brock's office, and Hal would be over him like with a ruler. It was just intense. Steve McQueen, he was the one that Brock had in mind because McQueen was a serious car person who understood what it all was about. And not too long after, McQueen had to back out of the project because he had cancer. They were really up against it. Needham said, 
I'm gonna talk to Bert about it. Never thinking that was gonna happen. So Andre Morgan called Bert and said, I'm gonna offer you $5 million for five weeks work. There was dead air on the other side of the phone. He said it was like Bert stopped breathing. It was the most money anybody had been offered up front. It was complicated with Bert coming in because Brock developed this vision. And now every day, Bert would have more things to write in the screenplay. The whole philosophy of the movie would change. It became farce. Bert didn't care that it really happened. It didn't make any difference to him. And he was gonna have a lot of fun with it, which happened to be a great thing because it became a happening and it became a party atmosphere. Everybody wanted to be in it and get in on the fun. Bert would say, I wonder who's off. I wonder who's on hiatus. Maybe they'd like to be in it. So the cast kept growing and growing. Every major motion picture star in the world is in this film. Farrah Fawcett had just come off the Charlie's Angels thing. It had Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Dom DeLuise, Roger Moore. It was one of Jackie Chan's early films. I mean, if you stood still long enough, you somehow had a part in it. How long it takes to get there? We are right in Wall Street. Go off to California. The movie's comical. To us, it was dead serious. So if you were actually to attempt a cannonball, you don't drive a Lamborghini Countach. There was never a Lamborghini Countach in any of the competitive runnings of cannonball. You couldn't put an extra fuel cell in the car. It wasn't going to get good fuel economy anyway. They're not inconspicuous when you want to be, but you couldn't have made a more evocative idea than to use a Countach. The actual cannonball races were really kind of the stuff of legend, these mysterious things that maybe happened or didn't, the fishtails of car guys. Did you ever think it would be a legendary thing? No, I never and, did. And no. no, never did. We're just a bunch of ne'er do wells who didn't have anything better to do. <laughs> <laughs> that race was sort of like Lamborghini itself. It's sort of this mythical thing that, you know, a teenage boy in Syracuse, New York, it's just one of these things you just read about. I always had this passion for exotic cars. I used to always wait for the road and track to show up so I could hopefully see pictures of these cars. If somebody saw a Lamborghini back in the 70s, it was probably a photograph in a magazine. The chances of actually seeing a Countach specifically were infinitesimal. To see it, you would have to go to a show. I mean, it's not as common as it is now with YouTube videos. Now Cannibal Run comes out. And the first four minutes of the film are only of the Lamborghini Countach. It is the first time most people got to see a Countach move. If you think about a car guy in 1981, he probably has never seen a Countach in person. He's never heard the V12 scream. And all of a sudden, his senses are just bombarded by that whole experience. You've got this Lamborghini that just comes out of nowhere in the desert. And you're like, what in the world is about to happen in my life? That iconic sound of that car over the beginning you know, there was nothing like it. Just that screeching halt in front of the 55. I mean, that's just everything. It's in one visual that is brought together the Brock Yates philosophy of life and driving the crossing out of the 55 mile an hour speed limit. It's not what you do, it's how you do. It doesn't matter what the rest of the movie is. Like, that's Cannonball. That is the greatest car you could have imagined at the time, driving, and then obviously the police are there, and you have this crazy police chase. You watch that car fly down that interstate, you think, my God, how much fun would this be? I probably wore out my VHS tape just rewinding and watching the intro over and over and over. The car just permeates the whole thing. That's what makes it. The Cannonball Run Countach, I think, really introduced everybody to 
the presence of an exotic car in real life. You saw it next to normal cars and it really put into people's minds like, this is really something special. When it's going down the road next to the Trans Am cop car, you can see it's half the size. You can really get a glimpse of how low and wide and radical the car really looked. It was exhilarating, it was exciting, it was scintillating. The world is just different afterwards. Now you have millions of people seeing this car driving and made Lamborghini a household name. All of a sudden, people knew what a Lamborghini was. They knew what a Countach was. That paved the way for so many different automotive enthusiasts around the world. I mean, it really was an aspirational front. We saw the car in a familiar enough context that you could almost make it a goal. That movie, in many ways, inspired a complete fascination with the Countach for many, many years, and supercars in general. The supercar market exploded after that. It's everything that the brand needed. The car is a 1979 Lamborghini Countach. LP400S. The Lamborghini Countach S is the answer to this question. What do you do for an encore when you already build the world's most exotic supercar? The S is even faster and more refined with even better handling. The LP400S, that's what changed the world. Those were the first Countaches with a rear wing. Maybe the wings didn't actually work. Maybe they provided more lift than downforce, but I'll tell you what they did is they made it look awesome. And that's really what it was all about, was like, how crazy cool can we make a car? And how much of a reaction can we elicit? Fastest production car in the world. They were lower, they had unique suspension. So if you look at the front wheels, they were tucked inside and the rear wheels were protruding from the rear. That's what people think of when they think of a Countach, is they think of a car with the flares. They think of a car with a wing. They think of a car with those wide Pirelli P7 tires. It's the car that was the poster on the wall. That's really when the Countach exploded. All these magazines start writing about the Countach as a production car. And I think the world went a little crazy after that. It elevated the brand in so many ways because when you looked at that vehicle, you automatically associated it with Lamborghini. Five speed, first gear is down and to the left with reverse above it. This was standard operating practice for years with this gated shifter. You're talking about a four liter V12 engine. If you've got six Weber 45 millimeter carburetors and these are side draft carburetors, so three on each side. This is a low body car, 105 of these cars built for the whole world. None came to the United States initially. Some were brought in, gray market, including this particular car. That car specifically was one of the first cars that was imported to the US by Trevor Thomas and Jazz Rawala. Their goal was to basically import the Lamborghini Countach, which was not legal in the US, and make it pass the EPA DOT standards. The idea they had to do that was a front bumper, essentially a front wing. Those uprights for the wing are attached underneath the hood with shock absorbers and all attached to the frame to suffice as a bumper. But it made the car look even more radical. They also installed a rear bumper as well. And if it wasn't for Trevor Thomas and Jazz, I don't believe that the Countach would have been imported into the US for many, many years after. Eventually, the factory actually used their designs and that developed into what we know now as the US Countach. That was developed by these two gentlemen that originally imported the Cannonball Run car. When someone gets into a Countach for the first time, it's very intimidating. You have to drive a Countach, you can't let it drive you. It doesn't have those kind of luxury things that you might find on other luxury cars. I call it automotive masochism. You're giving up what most people buy cars for. To be very bluntly honest, back in the day, these cars were extremely unpractical. These vehicles did not have power steering, there was no clutch assist, and you really had to be some sort of a healthy individual to be able to turn that steering wheel, push that clutch, and harness that type of performance. You've got this big V12 literally sitting right behind you. In the Countach, 
the transmission is in the front of the engine, if you will, and it's mounted backwards from what you would normally see in a front engine car and even some rear engine cars. So you've got your transmission going into the cockpit. It gets maybe eight miles to the gallon. It's loud. The first Series 1 and Series 2 LP400S cars were called low body. That's because they were actually a lower roof. Inside the car, there's not much room at all. Anyone over about five foot 11 is not gonna really fit in the car very comfortably at all. You have this raked windshield that literally comes almost just into your forehead. You're sitting very, very low. It's challenging to drive because it's so low, especially in the front, that any sort of dip in the road uh, can be very difficult. Even Lamborghini, after building 155 low body cars, raised the car up. Lamborghini rides, look, everybody's knocking the front spoiler off these cars, they're entirely too low. You have blind spots everywhere. It's nearly impossible to see out the rear three quarters. It's impossible to see out of the back. There's a, a tiny rear window in this car, and then this wing sits squarely in the middle of that. Valentino Balboni, who was the Lamborghini test driver, has made it uh, very famous to open up the door, sit on the door sill, and just look behind you as you're maneuvering the car. I think the attitude is what's behind you doesn't really matter. You're always going forward. You have the bars on the window, and then the window probably goes down maybe an inch and a half, two inches. I think the idea is enough on the driver's side to put your hand out if you're gonna pay a toll but that's all it comes down. There's no storage room in the car. You can't put luggage in the car. There is a trunk in the front, but it's minuscule. It's about the size of a shoe box. While there is a glove box here, all this is is your fuse box for the car. You have really just two little AC vents with a, let's call it a, a less than fantastic AC system. The air conditioning vents are on the console next to your knee. So you've got the air conditioning blowing on your car and a driver's right knee and a passenger's left knee are freezing. Interesting placement. It's the most useless automobile that's ever been conceived to fit into the context of what a Honda or a minivan might. Obviously, with all these, uh, let's call it nuances, it takes a lot of passion to learn the car. But once you really, truly understand the Countach, it's an experience like no other. It's made for the highway. That's where a Countach shines. And the car just feels so planted at over 100 miles per hour. There's not many cars of that generation that I feel comfortable in, and I'm never scared in a Countach. It was a performing beast. There's something about sitting inside a Countach that just makes you feel that you're in this Italian rocket ship. Because the hood is so dramatically sloped, when you're driving, it's panoramic. It's amazing view going forward. To this day, getting in a Countach is an, almost an emotional experience for me. The smell of the Italian leather, that sound from the V12, second gear into third gear, and the power just pulls through the RPMs. 
there's nothing like that feeling. I don't think manufacturers will ever duplicate it again. This is truly special. In the movie, there was a visual quality to the way it was shot. American consumers were stunned and dazzled by the Lamborghini. There was a sex quality, there was a power quality, there's a you-can't-have-it quality. That made such an impression on so many young individuals. Next it was, Mom, I need the poster, I need the model, I need this, I need that. All of a sudden, there's Countach posters all over the place. This was the icon. Lamborghini Countach just represents all of that craziness and excess. Because as tough as the 70s were, the 80s were different. The 80s were fun. Wild cars, wild clothes, wild hairstyles. The individual that grew up with a Countach hanging over his high school room, that was the level of success of what somebody wanted to aspire to. When we think about a dream car that we're fascinated with, Certainly the goal is I have to own one. Until I've achieved that dream, I, I gotta keep working. I mean, you look at your normal production car and there's these square boxes in the 80s and the Countach would attract crowds, it would attract attention, and it still is as exciting. It is the expression of excess, and it's the expression of being bold. Why do people buy it? Well, it's, a, it's the ultimate sort of outlaw statement, isn't it? It's uh, in a time when, you know, we've got uh, the, the Center for Automotive Safety and all of those people on one side and the Baptists on the other trying to sort of corral us and make us behave the way we're supposed to. You can very quickly establish yourself as being somewhere else just by parking one of those in front of your house. I'll never forget when I first watched the 60 Minutes special with Morley Safer, and he went to the factory and Valentino Balboni took him on back roads doing 160, 180 miles per hour in a Countach Quattro Valvole. That is a perfect intro into what Lamborghini is. This was a moment in time. This is no special effect. This is 180 miles an hour. There's a, a famous interview in the 60 Minutes special with the marketing director for Lamborghini at the time, Daniele Odetto, and actually did get in trouble for what he said. Is there such a thing as a typical Lamborghini purchaser, a typical owner? Yes, very large ego, because uh, if you're shy, you cannot go around with this car. It's like to go out uh, in the evening that is with a beautiful uh, woman, not everybody can afford, not because they don't have enough money or because they have enough power, but because they are uh, not the type that like to go out with a very beautiful woman. Now imagine this was the sense of the marketing at that time, and I don't think we'll ever see that again in history. It's not a very comfortable car, of course. You cannot go with uh, uh, baggages, etc. You must have another car, like a Rolls Royce that follow you with a chauffeur and arrive the day later. If you look at the early Countaches and you look at who they were delivered to, I mean, you're talking about Saudi sheiks, rock stars. You have Rod Stewart getting some of the first cars. You have Eddie Van Halen getting an LP400S, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they were produced for Playboys. You know, let's face it, it was an eccentric individual. Imagine pulling up in a Countach to somewhere in the 1970s or early 1980s. You would stop traffic. You would stop everything. I love this car, man. I love this car. Lamborghini is look at me car. Yeah, it looks like a spaceship. Yeah. It, it's very theatrical. Uh, how should we say that? It's very theatrical. So the Cannonball Run Countach was purchased by Ron Rice. He's a larger than life character, like many Countach owners. Ron Rice grew up in a log cabin. Today, the businessman's home is this remarkable Daytona Beach retreat. I'm a poor boy, grew up in the mountains of North Carolina, plunked out of nearly every school I was in and barely passed when I did pass. I uh, came down to Daytona Beach eventually and uh, went into the oil business in a different kind of way. I created Hawaiian Tropic. To Ron Rice, creator of Hawaiian Tropic sun care products, this is the lab, a place to test his natural royal dark tanning oil. I had no idea how to make suntan products. 
I bought a garbage can for four dollars and a broom for a dollar. I used that as my stir stick. And in our fifth year with Hawaiian Tropic, we were still mixing it in that garbage can. We were selling product like crazy. I ran with the seat of my pants. And then I got into product placement. Every three days, Hawaiian Tropic was in a movie or a TV show. Oh, it was amazing what it did. We did four Smoking the Bandits, two Cannonball Runs, and a BL Striker. So I was busy working with Burt Reynolds and Hal Needham for all those years through all those movies. We were welcome on the set anytime, anywhere. I mean, I was there a lot when they filmed the movie. The car was brand new when the movie was done. From what I understand, they actually bought it off the set. And met this guy. I looked at the car, I said, I said you own this car? And he, goes, he said, yeah. I said, you want to sell it? He said, yeah. I said, how much? I don't remember what he told me, but I, I, I took the money out of my pocket and paid him on the spot. I just liked it. I looked at it, liked it, and said, I want that. We had a lot of money. I could have bought any car in the world, anything I wanted. We were rolling in money. I just bought it from him for cash. Here. And I gave it to Burton Howe to use in the movie. We were there for all the scenes out in Vegas where they're running that thing and marking that 55 out. Well, it was an amazing car. The difference between men and boys is indeed the price of their toys. Ron can afford to be king of the road. The spoilers on the front and the back, the 12 pipes on the back. It was always in the, in the poster and see Hawaiian Tropic above it. Oh yeah, we used the Lamborghini a lot. And I drove it myself at 185 miles an hour on the Daytona Speedway. And I had a lot of pedal left, but I was afraid to do it. That engine hummed, boy, it was beautiful to hear. I mean, the sound they put out was just, made you, made you shake inside. The car was a chick magnet. Turned heads everywhere you went. I didn't have any trouble getting a date with it, that's for sure. He had a lot of fun with it. He told me stories of driving that car up and down Daytona Beach, having lots of friends in it. Uh, there are pictures of a lot of bikini-clad girls sitting in the car, sitting on the car. There's all these great stories of him using the car, enjoying the car. And listen, after that movie, it became an icon in the Lamborghini world. And I don't even think he realized the importance of the car when he owned it. We didn't care. If it felt right, we'll buy another one. <laughs> I had it a lot of years, I had it a long time. Kept it in the garage, kept it all nice, kept it shined up. I told everybody that after I owned that car, I said, if they make a better one or one that looks better than that, I'll buy it right on the spot. But they never did. They never made a better one. The Countach was, was the top of the line. That was, as far as I'm concerned, it was the best there was. Take a run through the gears in a Lamborghini Countach and you eclipse every speed reference on the books. First alone will thrust you well beyond America's statutory speed limit. The connection between loving cars and loving driving cars fast is, is actually pretty close. After the final running of the Cannonball in 1979, Brock Yates had said, I'm out. But the people who drove weren't done. And so some Cannonballers that had participated in the 70s, along with some new enthusiasts and fans, set up an event called the U.S. Express. There were not any new records set until the final running in 1983, where David Diem and Doug Turner in a Ferrari 308 set a time of 32 hours and seven minutes. The history very much went cold after the 80s. The first team that came public with a claim literally since 1983 was Richard Rawlings of Gas Monkey Garage and Dennis Collins, and they drove Dennis's 1997 Ferrari 550 Marinello with a time of 31 hours and 59 minutes. Now, they claim to have beaten 3251, which was the 79 Cannonball time. In fact, they had also beaten 3207, not exactly by average speed, because it was a lot shorter to drive from New York to LA in 2007 than it was in 1979. But regardless, they did a really, really great job, and they had done it in a really cool car. But a few months later, Alex Roy and Dave Maher revealed that they had done it a year earlier. They waited for the statute of limitations to run out because they were worried about prosecution, and he goes public with his new record, 31 hours and four minutes. 
When I spoke to Brock Yates in the mid 2000s after he'd released his book Cannonball, I told him that one day I wanted to do it and he was cordial enough to say good luck kid, but he'd been very clear that there's twice as many cars on the road, there's twice as many police officers employed and there's much harsher penalties if you ever were to get caught doing this sort of thing. And so he thought that even back then when they were doing it, if everything had gone right, that 30 hours was the wall. The only real thing you can kind of think of is, well, I just need to go out and see how fast I can do it by myself. It took years and years of saving and planning and credit card debt in order to get to the point of being able to one day buy a car that I thought was the right choice, the Mercedes CL55 AMG. In 2013, I finally had the car. I finally had some friends that I'd convinced to come with me. And so we decided it was time. You kind of get to New York in a reasonably prepared car with a team that has some idea of what they're doing. Ready, Dan? No. <laughs> and it's just kind of down the roller coaster. So you pull out of the Red Ball garage, you immediately get to Lexington, light's always red. And if you sit there, it's just agonizing because you're like, we have to average over 100 miles an hour. And so the anxiety just builds and every minute that you're not going over your average goal speed, you're like, I'm losing, this is not working. And then you know you gotta stop for gas and you know there might be traffic and you know your tires could explode. And so you kind of just earn the right to pull the arm of a mythical cannonball slot machine. We kept going faster than we thought we were supposed to, but we kind of never had many reasons to slow down. We passed five fixed speed traps in 2,800 miles, maybe a dozen cops driving in the opposite direction and all were pretty easy to pick out. And so you kind of expect when you hear about a cannonball that it's the deuce of hazard and that you're sliding around turns and jumping and hiding from cops. And all. It's not, it's the most boring thing you've ever heard of if it goes right. The car was really happy between 135 and 145 miles an hour. And most of the time there wasn't anybody out there with us. And so we had people on binoculars and all the gadgets running. And we got to the point that if we averaged the speed limit, we'd break 30 hours. And then we saw that we could break 29 hours. Just never really had to slow down. So you pull in to this quiet little beach hotel in the middle of the night and nobody has any idea what you're doing. Why are these three sweaty guys jumping out of this car, obviously exhausted, but also a little bit insane? So we had the valet take a picture, probably the worst picture that's ever been taken. For some reason, Dave's shoes were off, but we've just done it. And it was so surreal because I set the goal 2003, I'm 18 years old, I'm 28, standing there, tears down my face, looking out the pier at the Portofino. The idea that I'd been able to find a way to encapsulate everything I loved about cars into that very moment was perfect. We went to Denny's after. Okay, I have to ask you, where were you when you hit 150 miles per hour? Uh, there's a know? lot of answers to that question. <laughs> oh my goodness. So we did it in 28 hours and 50 minutes, which was an average right around 100 miles an hour. There was not a lot of immediate enthusiasm to try to beat my record, but I never expected to hold the record, much less hold it forever. And so in 2019, a couple friends of mine did. That's November of 2019. A few short months later, the world gets shut down. And in the three months after that, it gets broken 12 more times. Because apparently when there's nobody driving, there's nobody commuting to work and there's no cops on the job, it's pretty easy to get away with speeding across the country. So it appears that doing this during the COVID pandemic was at least a three hour advantage over what we would normally experience. And so at that point, the whole cannonball sandbox just gets slipped upside down. These guys are, I, my heart goes out to them. I, I think they're great. They're setting the records, but doing it during COVID with a GPS, with helicopters, yeah. with all that stuff, Advanced. that takes all the fun out of it. The, 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 the police were the, were the trump card. You know, today there's not an officiating body or a clearinghouse or somebody who decides what is a record, what isn't. I mean, there's no Guinness cannonball. But now that the dust has kind of settled on the pandemic runnings, uh, the fastest time was 25 hours and 39 minutes in Audi. As people have found it very, very easy to set records in the last few months, I hope that it doesn't keep people from continuing to dream. Warning, quit reading this immediately. What follows is a brief summary of a wasted life spent hanging around automobiles. In the event you are tempted to travel a similar road while resisting a thrilling career riding a desk as an accountant, computer geek, or tax analyst, I'm telling you, messing with cars is a dead end. Look at me. 
he and I would often talk about it, and especially as he became ill later on, I would say, you know, you've really been very lucky because you've been able to live your life on your terms. And he said, yeah, I've had a wonderful life. He had Alzheimer's, and I couldn't really get my arms around it because he was so bright that he was able to hide or cover up his deficits. I went and visited him, and I got to tell him, you know, that that thing I told you I was going to do back in 2004, I did it. To get to say, like, to this hero of mine that allowed me to look out over the Portofino Pier and say, wow, was, was everything. I think he left his readers with a great sense of comfort because they trusted him for the truth. I think that's the greatest legacy he could have lived. It was 12 years he had Alzheimer's. He was beautiful during it. He was wonderfully warm, but it certainly did make me appreciate who he was. One thing I've learned is that we all tend to think we're pretty much in control of our lives. But the most important things in your life, profound things, you really have little or no control over. That's kind of the way life goes. Back in 2001, I lost my wife in a car accident. Um, it was... Incredibly tragic. She was 32 years old. Jeff and I were together about 120 miles from his home, and he got a phone call. It was unbelievable, the longest and hardest road drive I've ever had in my life coming back. And you want so badly to make it right or to, to make it change. And I, I, I couldn't, there's something I couldn't fix. It took a couple years before I could function at all. But three years later, I got to this point in my life where I wanted to try to bring something positive out of that tragedy. And that's a tall order, but I felt that there had to be a reason that I was still here. So my brother and I formed a foundation and our idea was to take elements of some of the best exotic car events in the world, put it into one event, but then donate money to Make-A-Wish in Laura's honor and her memory. Make-A-Wish is an amazing group that grants wishes for children that are battling life-threatening situations. So in 2004, our very first Celebration Exotic Car Festival happened. That year we had 60 cars and we raised $20,000 and it was amazing. You know, those early days, it was just my brother and myself and we worked really hard to build the event. Everyone who works on the event is volunteer. All of the auction items are 100% donated and all the money goes to the kids. And it has grown into something that is absolutely massive. We've now raised over three and a half million dollars. And we've granted the wishes for more than 400 children over the years. Right from the beginning, we started to get some movie cars. And of course, to me, the ultimate movie car was Cannonball Run. So back in 2006, I called and I said, I would love to have the Cannonball Run car at our event. The very next day, I got a call. Hey, Jeff, this is Ron Rice. I have a conflict that weekend. However, I'm very happy to send the car over to your event. This was an amazing moment for me. So the car shows up that morning and the woman that Ron had sent with the car said, you know, Jeff, Ron may actually consider selling this car. Never in my life did I dream that I would actually even see the Cannibal Run car, much less own it. And I was already on my phone calling Ron. And I said, Ron, you know, I'd love to, to buy this car. I've loved this car my whole life. And he gave me a number that had a, a lot of zeros attached to it. And it was, it was out of my, budget, anything that I could possibly afford. Well, he wasn't going to pay enough money at first. And we actually put it up for sale, but it didn't bring much. It didn't have a very good audience that time. So I was going to send that to California where, where it would really bring the big bucks. And then he came here and said, I want it sold to me. Have it now. And that's what happened. After uh, almost two years, we finally struck a deal. I had recorded the Cannonball Run theme song on a cassette tape, and I drove out of Ormond Beach driving a Cannonball Run car listening to the theme from Cannonball Run. That's a moment I will never forget for the rest of my life. At one point, Ron had ripped the interior out and put in a dark red interior, and uh, 
The leather was getting a bit tattered. The car had some nicks and dents and bruises. Um, you know, Ron had this amazing life and the car looked like it had been well used. So I had the car and sent it directly into a two-year restoration. The fact that it needed the restoration was not of consequence to me. It was still the car, but I wanted it to look like exactly the way it looked when it was in the movie. The exact way it looked when I saw it back when I was a teenager on the film. You would hope that when it was restored, they left everything the way it was in the movie, and I think that's super important. The restoration effort was headed up by a good friend of mine named Tony Urardi, a very meticulous guy. Tony had had five Countach of his own. He knows everything there is to know about Countach, so I knew it would be done perfectly. Every nut, bolt, everything was done to exact standards. Virtually the whole car is still original. Everything has been refinished, but it's all original. So you have your original engine, the transmission, the wheels, these raw hand sanded down to the original magnesium and refinished with the original paint color. Full engine out, everything's completely disassembled, refinished and reassembled. We did have some cracks on the intakes, so those had to be fixed and remachined. The tan interior, the brown dash was the way it rolled out of the factory, exactly like this. The entire interior was done out in California. Every stitch of fabric you see on this was brand new when we did the restoration. He even took the detail to get the original license plate number. And as if the car wasn't outrageous enough from the factory, these 12 exhaust pipes were added for the film. Now, these two gauges here, this voltmeter and oil temperature gauge, were in the car for the movie, but were never attached to anything. When I bought the car, it still had the CB antennas. All these little things, they're such an important part of its time and an important part of the history of Lamborghini. It shipped up just in time for the Celebration Exotic Car Festival in 2012. It came out beautiful. The car is just absolutely everything I could have asked for. It's an incredible community. I mean, the best friends I have in the world were met through the car world. I met my wife through the car world. 10 years after I lost Laura, I met Kayla, who is the most incredible person. I met her at Ferrari Central Florida. She's a car person. We were married in 2013, and she is my best friend, my supporter. Everything I do, I do with Kayla. She's my whole world. I love to take it out for rides and enjoy just the driving experience. Yes, they're beautiful pieces of art, and I love to look at the cars as well but it, they were really made to be driven. They run better when they're driven, especially on these old carbureted cars. That's why the cars were built. Any Lamborghini is a rolling circus, especially the Cannonball One car. So when you park anywhere, a lot of people come around. If he pulls up someplace and a kid comes over, he's the first one to ask the parent if it's already for the kid to get in the car, you let the kid get in the car. The reaction is, is always you know, shock and awe. People of a certain age group that remember Cannonball Run, of course, associated immediately with the movie. It's incredible to me. I, mean, I still can't believe I own the Cannonball Run Countach. I've loved this car for 40 years. It's certainly the most famous Countach in the world. I still can't believe it's sitting in my garage. I'm just the current steward of this car. I mean, I'm the third owner, but eventually someone else will have it. And I hope it's someone else who loves this car as much as I do. And someone that will share it and will bring it to Concours and will drive it. When I started, probably 15 years ago producing car shows and, and my passion was vintage Lamborghinis because it was what I grew up around. You know, people would make fun of me and say, oh, you're selling these old Playboy's cars. And that was sort of a lot of the comments, you know, ostentatious, uh, too loud. You know, serious collectors did not take the cars seriously. And I think that's changed. The resurgence is finally to where we have the expendable income to actually buy the things that we dreamed about guys are able to finally take it off of the wall and put it in their garage. It's kind of a neat time to be around. Now, if you're able to buy one, it only is worth more tomorrow than it is today. And the more that you drive it, the more likely it is to go that next mile. At one point, Kundashas were trading for 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars. And, you know, one day we won't see a Countach less than a million dollars. People are realizing how important these cars are in terms of automotive history you really have to look at the Countach as the blueprint for all hypercars today and all supercars. When Lamborghini welcomed Horacio Pagani, this young Italian designer who once worked in the factory, to come in and take an already beautiful piece 
and modernize it slightly, make it a little bit more aggressive, do stuff that was a little bit cutting edge. The result was the 25th anniversary. That's essentially the last Kundash produced. Roger Pagani has his own company now. It makes a handful of hand-built supercars every year. When you look at today's modern hypercar or supercar like a Pagani, you are entering a part of this family that Ferruccio cultivated and created over there. If you look at Lamborghini's lineage since the Countach, they've always set the mark in terms of that wow factor. It's been a phenomenal ride with this cannonball thing. It's 50 years this year. I'm not sure that you ever get many of those things that you're personally involved in in life that has a legacy like this, that kind of weaves itself in and out of generations and holds people's imagination. You still got your Ferrari? I still got my Ferrari. I still got my Porsche. Mm -hmm. When are we going? I can still drive it. I can too. <laughs> The ethos of Cannonball was very much, I want to do this, and I've found a way. And the ethos of owning and driving a Countach is exactly that. It's a reflection of how I love cars. I want that, and I figured out a way to buy it, and now I'm going to use it. And it means a lot to me to be able to. When you look at 17 model years of Countach production and over 1900 built, there's a lot of standouts. I mean, there's a lot of great examples, but I think if you had to pick one that just defines everything that the car ever wanted to stand for, you can't do any better than this car. It was almost like magic when that car was created. It'll never happen again, and it was just perfection on that day and in that moment. That's what the Countach is.